I'm embarking on an epic adventure. From spectacular natural landscapes to the busiest cities in the world. China, the place to explore the treasures of an ancient civilization. I find this really very special indeed. A culture that has lasted for thousands of years and which continues to shape this great nation. I've really been looking forward to seeing this. And to truly understand the secrets of a country's soul, I think you need to immerse yourself in its art. Time for the journey to begin. First stop, Shanghai. The bustling city on the banks of the Huangpu River, a glittering modern-day metropolis that's home to a remarkable 3,000-year-old bronze cauldron. Then down to South China to join the Liao family's preparations for the annual tomb sweeping day. Really, uh, Alistair, Alistair Liao for the day. <laughs> and see an exquisite sedan chair that some say took nearly 10,000 hours to make. This is the most OTT piece of splendiferous bling I think I've ever seen. Exploring the ancient links between Chinese art, ancestral traditions, and families, China's most precious treasures. Early each year, one of the world's greatest annual migrations gets underway. 500 million Chinese city dwellers making their way home to celebrate the Chinese New Year with their families. Though the scale of this movement is a modern phenomenon, its roots buried deep in ancient Chinese history. Yes! <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah. Well done, time. Howard, look at that. <laughs> Family life is the driving force behind many aspects of Chinese culture. But this sense of family love is not restricted to living family members. Long dead ancestors are equally important for the Chinese. Ancestor worship, that was already a big thing in China during the Bronze Age, long before Confucius promoted it. And today, a reverence for one's ancestors, it remains of central importance to the whole Chinese concept of family life. The Shanghai Museum in People's Square is one place where you could see how the ideas of family and ancestry have influenced Chinese art. Home to more than 140,000 exquisite cultural relics, Pride of Place belongs to a national treasure that powerfully symbolizes this Chinese reverence for ancestors. A 3,000-year-old bronze cauldron, the Da Kua Ding. what's completely remarkable when you come and see this ding up close is the intricacy of the decoration because you know this is a big object it's colossal yet that's offset by all of this embellishment have a look on the two cooking handles on either side here's this interlaced pattern it feels to a western audience like it could be almost celtic it actually consists of different dragons that are overlapping one on top of the other. It gives it this really dynamic, pulsing, sort of writhing energy. These ritual bronze vessels, they develop this green 
patina. But think about when this was originally cast. It would have been golden, shiny, all of those pulsing lines sparkling. It probably would have been cast and used in an ancestral temple to honor the gods, to honor one's ancestors, and cooked food would have appeared inside the ding. And we do know, in fact, who commissioned it because there's this long inscription. You have 290 characters. I mean, really, it's a historical document. It's one that transforms the ding into a family heirloom. Dr. Wei Xinying is an associate research librarian at the Shanghai Museum. Was it the case then that ancestors were considered, were worshipped as gods? In China, the ancestors were not called as gods, but they had some powers. For example, they were able to bring their children to the gods. Amazing as this work of art is, to really get a sense of the power of the spell it worked in ancient times, you have to imagine how it was when it was filled with delicious sacrifices. The bond between the living and the dead in Chinese culture is shown in the craftsmanship of the Da Kuo Din. But does this ancient reverence for the ancestors remain a potent force in modern day China? Time to leave Shanghai and head for Baogai Town in Hunan Province to find out. the ancestral hall of the Liao clan. Every year, several hundred clan members come from all over the world to pay their respects to the ancestors on the tomb sweeping day. This festival is becoming more and more joyous. It feels like there's an air of anticipation yeah. and jubilation. It's like a party. It's like a Chinese Thanksgiving. 23-year-old Peng Ming Gao majored in social sciences, and he just returned after graduating in the U.S. As head of the Liao clan, Peng's grandfather has a special role to play in the tomb-sweeping ceremony. Is the idea that the ancestors are actually being sort of summoned into the hall? Yes. So they're in the, in the sort of spirit realm, generally. Mm -hmm. And then at this moment, this is a sacred place. The fireworks, the oration, the music, the firecrackers. To welcome them, to alert all the ancestors that the ritual is about to begin. So wake them up. And the second point is to scare away and to ward off some like evil spirits. I see. Which may be lurking around. According to Peng Ming Gao's mother, it's essential for everyone to participate in the ritual wholeheartedly. Oh, is this for me? Yeah, this is for you. Are you sure? I'm not really a Alistair, Alistair Liao for the day. <laughs> Thank you. Intoxicating and impressive. Echoing to the sound of firecrackers and music, this is a warm, special day for Peng Ming Gao and his clan. 
a time for everyone to feel at one. And there, right in front of the altar, is a ding. Different from the round ding in the Shanghai Museum, but a ding nonetheless. I'm standing here in 2019, and there's a ding in front of the altar, a shrine to the ancestors. And a few days ago, I was with the darker ding, and that was made at the start of the first millennium BC. So to have this sense from antiquity to the present day, an unbroken chain, something which transcends our everyday worldly concerns, it's really moving. It's really, really special to see. At the graves, flowers and sacrifices are offered to the deceased. And the idea is that we burn paper money at each tomb? Yes. Then it's time for the clan's big lunch. This is the top table. Yes. And all the food's being served. Who sits there? The spirits of ancestors. So actually we believe that ancestors will come here and join us to have lunch together. So we prepare all kinds of their favorite foods. Yeah. So we're honored to be sitting so close at yes. the top table. Yeah. So we are blessed. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. On memorable afternoons like this, respects are paid to these spirit guests. So we just, we just tuck in now. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Mm. But the durability of Tomb Sweeping Day doesn't rest on paying respects to the ancestors alone. Such traditions have to adapt to the changing times. For Pung Ming Gao's clan, there's nothing more precious than his clan's genealogy books, charting the ups and downs of the family fortunes. This is the family history? Yes, of the past 44 generations. 44 generations, gosh. Today, the names of Pong Ming Gao's mother and his grandmother were added to the genealogy book. This entry of my mom. Ah, that's you. Yeah. My dad. In the 800-year history of the clan, they are the first women to be recorded. He was born in 1936. <laughs> the inclusion of women is something the ancestors would surely celebrate. Next up, a cultural relic of unimaginable value, a sacred ceremony, and a wedding, all of which can cast even more light there we go. on the ancient roots of China's great traditions. Every culture has its own story. Over time, it is beliefs and tradition that hold a people together, giving meaning to their habits and way of life, making them unique and the world a vastly more interesting place as we come to discover more about each other.
Hangzhou, Eastern China, a legendary city famous for its West Lake. Once likened to a beautiful lady by the Song Dynasty poet, Su She, the West Lake is just one of many ancient links between art, family, and the ancestors. For most people, the lake adds a touch of love and romance to this popular tourist destination. more luxurious than this bridal sedan chair, then I'd really like to hear about it because for me, this is, I think, without question, the most OTT embellished, splendiferous piece of bling I think I've ever seen. This golden sedan chair used to be carried by eight people. On the wedding day, the bride's family used it to show off their wealth and power. What an extraordinary scene that must have been. I mean, if you look at this passage here with all of these beautiful tassels and pieces of cut glass, and beneath you can then see there's a, a hanging pagoda above these different dragons with bats and four boys resting on the dragon's heads. But the thing that is perhaps quite surprising in amongst all of these symbolic pieces of fruit and insects and creatures and these operatic scenes is you can spend as long as you like studying them all, and what you won't find is a pair of young lovers enamored of one another. Fan Pei Ling, the director of the Department of Craftsmanship, Zhejiang Provincial Museum, has written several books on China's wedding customs and lacquerware. What's the real meaning of a sedan chair? Oh, I see. That was that part of the point of it then? 对的，对的，因为在中国古代，就是男女地位可能是不平等，但是就是说新娘的爸爸妈妈就是怕她的女儿在丈夫家里她受欺负，所以就把她所需要的所有的东西，就小的一直到一根针一根线给她这个送给她
is to announce their marriage to their friends and relatives. How traditional, or not, is the ceremony tomorrow going to be? It's like half traditional, like it's like a combination of the two. two. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I mean, you're not arriving in a sedan chair. Uh, yes, I think it's too traditional. It's like I'm the I'm too passive. So then we choose a more ancient for, uh, version of it, which it's is the, the, the removing of the fan. fan. She 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 will come I'm holding upstairs. the fan like this, and yeah. everybody can see my face. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. And my father is with me. Yeah. So yeah. I. If so, I'm pleased, yeah. I'll take off the fan. If I'm not, I'll go away. You turn, oh my God, that, there's some real jeopardy here. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Yeah. Why is it so important for you both to have these traditional elements within the ceremony? It's like, I think Western people turn to believe in God, and, but I think Chinese people tend to believe in our ancestors' wisdom. Yes. I think you're much more mature than I was when I got married. Oh. In the sense, I, I thought it was all about us, but it isn't. It's about yeah. the whole family. Yeah. yeah. I think family is um, like the most basic unit of Chinese society, and I think it's also the most important unit of Chinese society. Do you need some help? <laughs> I've never been to a Chinese wedding before. Having been part of these preparations yesterday in a small way, I'm really excited now to see what the ceremony is actually like. And I've heard that it's customary in China to give the bride and groom a present in the form of money. So I have this red envelope and inside some crisp banknotes because I believe it's polite for them to be crisp. And of course, they have to be red because red is the auspicious color wishing good fortune and prosperity upon the happy couple. At the core of any wedding the world over is this real depth, this truth and sincerity of emotion. And the thing that fascinated me about this particular ceremony was how eclectic it was. You could call it the, the ultimate postmodern wedding because Scarlet and Badger, they, they, they took this supremely stylish, pick-and-mix approach to all of the different traditions and customs from Chinese weddings through the ages. So I think the expectations, the pressures from society and family, they still linger, they're still present, but for this couple at least, they clearly felt free to invent new traditions of their own.